Abby, are we ready to go? Yeah? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Oh, that sounded so fun to be able to say that. To those that are online, a good morning to you as well. So we have both people um, virtually and in person. Uh, just a quick good morning. My name's Tammy Miller. I'm the Director of Outpatient Services for On With Life. I oversee our clinic in Ankeny, as well as the one here in Coralville. And you guys get to listen to me introduce everybody today. Yay! That's exciting, right? Thanks for the woohoo! <laughs> Anyway, I want to just take a moment to say thank you. Thank you for supporting us and coming out today and attending our first On With Life Parkinson's Conference. We really hope to be able to make this an annual event. So if you enjoy today, please be sure to note it on the survey that you're gonna get. Um, we're always looking for feedback, for ideas, for topics, locations, um, that sort of thing. So we definitely wanna hear your input at the end of the day. Just a quick brief survey, or a kind of just a quick um, little bit about On With Life for those of you not familiar with us. So On With Life actually started in Ankeny, uh, and we started 30 years ago as an inpatient uh, rehabilitation program where we served individuals with brain injury. That's what we were known for originally. Um, over the years, we have added multiple programs um, to serve not only brain injury, but stroke and other neurological conditions. 10 years ago, we actually opened our first outpatient program in Ankeny. And with that opening, uh, we began to look at other diagnoses that we felt we could best serve. And in that came Parkinson's because back in, um, when we started that program, there was not much in central Iowa for specific Parkinson's programming. And so we felt like that was something we could bring our skills to and be able to meet the needs of that population in the central Iowa area. And so that's how we ended up getting started with Parkinson's. You'll hear more today about how that community of people kind of <coughs> ended up branching into something more than we ever expected. And with that has shaped our programming that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, you, might, you might know like the, the, the words LSVT, big and loud. A lot of people with Parkinson's have heard of that. That's actually how we started our programming. And we were like, yes, LSVT, big and loud. We saw great, we did some research around it. We were seeing great outcomes, all that sort of thing. But what we found is that we would do LSVT, big and loud for four weeks and then we would discharge people, but as we all know, Parkinson's is a progressive condition. And while LSVT is a great tool, there are other components that we needed to address. And so from that, we've kind of continued to develop um, our programming to now a more comprehensive type of approach, and that's what you should hear throughout the day. So, Oh, and see, I get distracted really easy. So you're gonna have to keep me on target today. So really, I'm supposed to be talking about our history, right? So then, so really, from Ankeny, then about a year and a half ago, we actually opened our second outpatient clinic in Coralville. So we're just about 10 minutes from here for our second location. So just a couple quick housekeeping items, and then we'll get to the whole point that you're here and listening to some of our speakers. So. We want to give an extra shout out to our sponsors and exhibitors. They allowed, have, because they have supported us and supported you all, they've allowed us to be able to do this conference for free for all um, persons with Parkinson's and their care partners. So we're very, very thankful for that. It also allowed us to be able to offer low cost CEUs for medical providers in the community. An extra shout out to my staff, um, and you're gonna see them all in On With Life shirts. A lot of us have this orange color on today, um, but some of them have another On With Life shirt on as well. If you see any of us with the On With Life logo items, don't hesitate to ask us questions. Um, we're here to help you throughout the day today. But an extra shout out to both of them. We have staff here from the Coralville Clinic, but also from the Ankeny Clinic that traveled today. 
Um, COVID precautions, I can't not address these. Just an extra reminder to social distance, wear your mask, and sanitize a lot. Bathrooms, because those are pretty important. If you haven't found them already, they're right near where you came in and registered. So there's both men's and women's are right, right smack dab there. Food, so we're gonna keep you hydrated and fed today. So that's a good thing, right? So we got tons of donut holes. I'm assuming they haven't ate them all yet, right guys? Okay, so we don't wanna take them back to the clinic. So take some donut holes for later. Um, so help yourself to donut holes, coffee, we have water and we have soda. And then for those watching online, we will have a staff member that will be able to chat um, with, with the exhibitors later. So you will also get to meet those exhibitors if you're online. If you have questions, chat them to us in the, the comments and then that will allow us to go ask them your questions and get back to you. If you, those online, <coughs> the, I have really bad allergies, guys, I promise. Um, <laughs> I've taken like four COVID tests this week, so we're good. Um, so watch, uh, if you lose connection, go back to the link provided in the email that you received today. That link will get you back in to the conference. Um, if you have questions, and we'll put this in the chat, and you need to get a hold of us immediately, we are gonna provide the On With Life emergency cell phone number in the chat below. Um, it's 319-383-4041. Now, don't all make crank calls to that number, guys, but if you need to contact us, you can use that number. For those that need CEs, please, sure, please be sure to sign in and out on the chat function if you're virtual, because that's how we're going to be able to know that you're here, both morning and afternoon. Those that are here that are providers also, please make sure you sign in at the registration desk if you haven't when you came today, but then also when you leave. Now, I'm just gonna wanna quick go through your packet. If you haven't looked through it already, in here, in your folder, the one thing I'm gonna specifically go through is the stuff in the folder. <coughs> you will find on, on the, uh, It'd be if you were holding it. It'd be your right hand side. Will be the packet with about the speakers today, um, some different ads. But on the very back page, if you haven't found it already, there's a bingo card. <coughs> You're gonna take that bingo card and, and if you visit things, so it's just like a regular bingo, either straight across, diagonal, you can go for all blackout if you wanted to. But each place has a dauber, and they'll mark this for you. Once you have your bingo, turn it back in at the registration desk. We're doing drawings at the end of today for different prizes. The next page before the bingo card is the survey, and this is where we're looking for any input from you guys as to what we can do better next year or ideas that you might have. And now, that all being said, we'll get to the part that everybody really came for, and that is hearing our speakers. So the first speaker that I'm gonna bring up is Kate Thompson. Oh, I'm supposed to also say, um, silent your cell phones so that we just don't interrupt um, speakers. Uh, and there are quiet rooms if you also need to take a break. We can find you a kind of quieter, quieter area to kind of get away if necessary. So let me introduce you to Kate. Kate has worked for our On With Life Coralville Clinic for, one, for a little, since we opened, so a little over a year. She's been practicing occupational therapy for four years with a primary focus on persons served with neurological diseases. She completed her Master's of Occupational Therapy in 2016 and her Bachelor's of Psychology in 2014. While working on it as an occupational therapist, Kate has had the pleasure to treat persons served in inpatient rehab, outpatient, and skilled nursing settings. And she also has additional certifications as a certified brain injury specialist 
and as an LSVT uh, clinician. So I'd like to introduce you to Kate. She is going to talk with you today about how Parkinson's affects vision and visual perception. Please welcome Kate. All right, good morning. Well, can everyone hear me okay? Good, okay, I'm short. I realize I may have to bring this closer, so if you need it louder, please raise your hand. So thank you for joining us so early this morning. I hope everybody slept well last night. I know I did, because I used my new corduroy pillow. Nobody's heard about corduroy pillows. No, they're making headlines. Uh, there it is. <laughs> so let me pull up my notes here. Okay, so today we'll be talking about vision and visual perception changes that can occur with Parkinson's disease. It's an often overlooked area. So the main things that we'll discuss today, identify the common visual changes that happen with Parkinson's, describe the subcategories of visual perception, now it's very different than vision, and discuss what we can actually do about it, so task and environmental modifications. So vision, visual perception, and proprioception are the pillars that make up balance. That's why this matters so much initially. If one of these are impaired, the risk of falls increases drastically. If we cannot see and understand how we are interacting with our environment, it is much harder to move efficiently and effectively. Vision and visual perception also impact driving significantly. Additionally, visual hallucinations and disturbances can be common with Parkinson's disease not quite as um, interplayed as the visual changes, but still a component. I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear very well. Better? Is this any better? Good. Okay. So the first area, looking at what actually happens within the eyes and the visual tract. So before we can discuss what functional changes happen with vision and visual perception, we need to have a basic understanding of how vision actually works. So information comes in through the eyes and is reflected back on the retina. That then goes in through the optic nerve that crosses at something called an optic chiasm and then transfers back to the visual cortex of the brain where the image is actually translated. So at any point during this process, something can get disrupted. So multiple changes can occur with vision in relation to Parkinson's disease. The APDA reports that people with Parkinson's disease are 60% more likely to experience visual problems than people without Parkinson's disease. While dry eyes and decreased acuity are not uncommon with aging in general, loss of depth perception, double vision, and poor perception of color are not part of the normal aging process, but these can change with Parkinson's. Acuity changes or difficulty focusing with coordination, um, those can change. And coordination of the eyes would be things like pursuits or saccades. What that actually means is pursuits is the searching movement in which we move our eyes quickly such as when we're driving or scanning for vehicles, um, pedestrians. Oh, I apologize, that's actually saccades. Saccades is the searching movement. Pursuits is the fluid smooth movement in which we target a slowly moving target, and that is more of our, our reading vision, so trying to slowly follow. When these break down, it is much more difficult to get accurate visual information. Additionally, double vision can occur when changes in eye alignment occur. This can happen with incoordination of the eyes or difficulty in accommodating for a slight misalignment. So just as muscles throughout the body change, muscles that control the eyes can also change. If that happens, you don't have both eyes looking at one target and you can get an overlapping of the image. Dry eyes are very common with average aging, however, may increase with Parkinson's disease, as people may not blink as often, 
or close their eyes fully during blinking. This does not allow adequate lubrication of the eyes. We'll discuss this more in a moment, but people with Parkinson's disease may also experience reduced tear production or tear quality. Reduced dopamine impl impacts how the brain can perceive color. So people with Parkinson's disease may experience difficulty distinguishing between shades of colors or may not see colors as vibrantly as before. Lastly, reduced depth perception may occur with a double vision or changes in double, excuse me, visual perception. So what can we actually do about these visual changes? So first thing is we should talk to your doctor and your optometrist optometrist or ophthalmologist, whoever is following you. We can also look at changes in the settings of computers and phones. Um, we can look at changes in glasses, accommodations, and importantly also speaking with an occupational therapist. So the good news is there's things that we can do about this. The primary physician may recommend eye drops, either over the counter or prescription. The thickness of these drops depends on specifically what you need. It can be a very liquidy or it can be a very viscous. Um, that really is gonna depend on the needs of the person, but they also may change some Parkinson's medications that can contribute to that tear quality or the tear production. In addition to the primary uh, physician, an optometrist or ophthalmologist will check to make sure that your lens prescription is up to date for one. And there may recommend a transition from contacts to glasses, particularly if there is dry eyes going on. If double vision is occurring, they may fit you for a prism. That's actually what is pictured above there. There are press-on prisms that change how the image is reflected in the eye and can actually take that image that's doubled and move it back into one. If that works, they'll actually do a permanent etching on the glasses and that can help realign the image into one versus that overlapping image. Additionally, occupational therapists are experts in modifying tasks and environments to promote performance and success. So modifications to items or the environment that may help would be um, adaptations for contrast sensitivity, such as increasing the contrast on a phone or a computer, using brightly colored items like plates or bowls, and adding night lights for compensation of the decreased acuity and um, contrast. So instead of trying to get up during the middle of the night and walk to the bathroom in the complete dark, adding a quick motion sensor nightlight can really help increase that, that safety with vision. Additionally, occupational therapists specialize in helping people do the things that they want and need to do. Within vision therapy, OTs work closely with neurooptometry and neuroophthalmologists to best address the ocular motor control and improve vision. So neurooptometry is actually a specialization within the study of the eyes and the brains working together. A neurooptometry consult can be very helpful in identifying the internal ocular changes that are impacting vision and also assist in guiding the OT in the appropriate um, exercises and accommodations that will best help you. They're also particularly helpful in fitting people for prism lenses and changing those things within the glasses. So as we've talked about, the eyes can actually change in how they're moving, but the eyelid can also be impacted. So Parkinson's can affect the movement of the eyelid as much as other parts of the body. Dystonia, slowed or smaller movements, and brain connection disruptions can contribute to difficulty in controlling the eyelids effectively. This can result in spasms, technical term for that is a blepharospasm, or it can also result in a drooping lid, which is referred to as ptosis. So Parkinson's affects the movements of the eyelid, but that can look like excessive blinking that's caused by dystonia or the involuntary muscle contractions. What a physician may actually do for that is recommend a Botox consult to see if we can calm down those muscles that are overreacting. Inefficient or too little blinking can contribute to the dry eyes as well as changes in production. So in addition to Parkinson's medicines potentially making the eyes dry, too little blinking can also dry out the eyes. And as we discussed, um, eye drops can be quite helpful for that. 
Additionally, difficulty with opening the eyelid sufficiently can be caused by a disruption in the brain signals to the eye. So while a drooping eyelid may not seem very problematic, binocular vision is necessary for accurate depth perception. So meaning when you go to reach for something, you're much more efficient if you can see that with both eyes versus a partial image of one and a full image of the other. So what is actually pictured here is an eyelid crutch. So that is a structure that is attached to the glasses that lifts the eyelid just slightly to allow that to open a little bit better. So that crutch supports the eyelid and allows for further lift for the weakened eyelid. They are low profile. There is also transparent tape that can be used to give a little bit more lift. But the benefit is providing additional support to the eye so that we can get that clear vision. On the downside, it will make it a little bit more difficult to fully close the eye, so that is something to consult your optometrist or your physician to make sure we don't need eye drops. So moving on to visual perception. So far we've discussed the visual changes that can happen within the eyes and the optic tract. These were more of a physical impairment, such as coordination problems, choppy eye movements, poor closure of the lid, etc. Visual perception is more so what the brain does with the information that the eyes are bringing in. Visual perception is made up of several subcategories. And they all manage different aspects of what the brain does with the information. So when visual perception is going well, it helps us perform things like picking out items of clothing that we want to wear, finding matching shoes, reading a favorite book, or as it's important to all of us, driving a car. Visual perception stems from the visual cortex of the brain, so thinking that back area of the brain. When Parkinson's affects this area, it can break down parts of visual perception and complicate the person with Parkinson's ability to complete basic tasks. So let's move on to the individual components and how they affect life. At the very basic, form constancy is the ability to recognize that an object is the same even when it has changed in size or has been rotated. Everyday examples of this is difficulty following directions with pictures. So think you just bought that new desk from Ikea and we're trying to follow along with that, you know, how well that goes on a daily basis. Um, building things using picture directions, problems recognizing unfamiliar handwriting or new fonts, difficulty recognizing people when they are wearing different clothing, and difficulty in letter recognition. Figure ground perception seems to be the area that I find most impacted with the people that I'm treating. And what that actually is, is the ability to pick out or recognize individual things in a busy environment. So think of finding the parts that make up the whole. Um, the example that I often give is you walk into your kitchen looking for a specific measuring spoon and you open up that junk drawer. When this area is impacted, it's very difficult to find that one measuring spoon out of all of that stuff that's in there. So functionally, this is the inability to sort and match socks when folding laundry, difficulty locating um, clothing and drawers during dressing, we call that IDLs, um, missing road signs or vehicles when driving, especially in heavier traffic, or the inability to locate items in a drawer or a cabinet. In addition to visual uh, figure ground, visual closure is the other area that seems to be impacted significantly with Parkinson's disease. And that goes right along with figure ground, but it's more of filling in the information that's missing. So the ability to recognize that an item, even when part of it is covered, is still that item. So in daily life, that can be difficulty identifying traffic signs that are partially covered. So think of you're driving up to a stop sign and it's half covered by part of a branch. When this is going well, we know that we see that red, we see part of that shape, and we can fill in the missing information. When visual closure is very impacted, it's difficult for the brain to recognize that that part of the sign actually equals the whole sign. So that can look like missing the stop sign and running it. Um, that can also appear as if you're going to the refrigerator and it's packed full of food, you just got groceries. Being able to pick out the milk is in there if it's half covered by, say, the orange juice. So recognizing that individual part that makes up the whole of the item. Visual memory is the ability to recall details about what has been seen. 
Now, oddly enough, when I'm doing MVP testing or the visual perception testing with a lot of my Parkinson's folks, this does not seem to be impacted nearly as much. But if this is not going well, what it looks like is inability to remember sight words, um, oftentimes transposing words, so substituting one that looks similar to the other, um, getting lost in familiar routes or newly learned routes, so taking your dog for a walk on that same walk you've always gone, but maybe now not recognizing your landmarks. This can also be difficulty remembering faces or new people. Visual motor integration is kind of what puts it all together. So it's the ability to quickly and accurately physically interact with visual stimuli. So in less fancy terms, you have somebody cut you off while you're driving, you see that visual stimuli, and very quickly you move to the brake. When this is impaired, it slows down that whole reaction time. Um, this can also be handwriting, so taking that movement, we know how to form that letter A, but figuring out how to move the hand to make that. Um, difficulty completing a puzzle or construction of an object with picture instructions. And difficulty engaging in physical leisure activities, so think swimming, golf, all those things that involve you seeing something and physically doing something about it. Visual attention is the ability to focus on a desired visual information despite background distractions. So you can see how a lot of these things play into each other. When this area is impacted, it's difficulty efficiently uh, or effectively scooping food during a family meal, poor concentration in driving, difficulty reading, or difficulty attending to a task with background music and noise. Um, functionally, how I've seen this present in the clinic is during mealtime, someone will do great with feeding themselves if it is a quiet environment, but going out to a restaurant or having family over, now suddenly it is a lot harder to actually bring that scoop of food up to the mouth or find what they're looking for on a plate. Still? Okay. Better? All right. With depth perception, this is the ability to correctly estimate the distance between body and items. So when this is impaired, this is the misjudging of distances with pouring liquids. So you're baking your favorite cake, you go to pour the milk, but it's missing the measuring cup. Um, it can also result in fender bender auto, auto accidents, running stop signs, um, having a hard time with putting on makeup or putting in contacts or difficulty reaching for items, such as going to reach for a pill that a loved one is giving you, but coming up too short. So now that we've broken down all the different types of visual perception, let's discuss what we can actually do about it. It's rare that only one area of visual perception will be impacted. A lot of these play off of each other. So frequently multiple areas are impacted, um, such as depth perception, figure ground, and spatial relationships. So the first thing that we can look at doing is to simplify the environment. Reducing those visual distractions, so cutting out really busy patterns, um, moving rugs that have a really, really strong pattern on them, taking away placemats, those things can help someone focus on what they actually need in that environment. Also adding more spacing between items, so thinking about in your kitchen cabinets, maybe not having everything grouped so closely together, but adding a little more space so that everything is clearly visible. Covering the excess, so oftentimes in the clinic I'll hear complaints that someone who has usually been a pro with their phone or has always spent the afternoons watching TV is now having difficulty using that remote control or the phone. So if we can cover up the extra things on that remote or phone that we don't need, now the brain is able to focus on what it actually needs to find, such as the channels, the volume, and the power button. Um, this is also super common with microwaves. We have all those things right at the top of beverage, popcorn, meat, um, defrost. If someone's having difficulty with using the microwave and they've always known how to do it, covering up the extra stuff that they don't use will help them be a lot more successful with actually using that. And then reducing the choices that are available. 
So making it a routine to keep commonly accessed items in the same place all the time. So we don't have to search around for these things. We know and we form that habit that it's here, I'm gonna go here automatically. In reducing the amount of choices, don't have four different brands of a spice. Keep your one cinnamon. Or having just a couple choices of beverages in the fridge. Now there's not as much for the brain to have to focus on and it can actually get what it wants. We can also look at assistive technology, and this doesn't have to be something huge. What's actually pictured here is a line guide. Um, we've gotten ours at the clinic for about a dollar on Amazon. And what that can do is when you have a really busy written page, using something that has a little bit of a highlighter on it can accentuate what the person needs to look at and keep them focused versus getting lost in the pages. For handwriting or for signing things, there are also um, templates where it'll be, say, in the shape of a check, and it'll have a cutout for the signature, the date, and all those amounts. So it can keep you right on track of where you need to write instead of having, say, your signature go way up or having the amount of the check in the wrong place. Um, if driving is no longer an option, there are now a lot of other assistive ways to get around. Um, particularly in the bigger cities, things like GoGo -Go Grandparent, those team up with Uber and Lyft. And those ride services might be a little more difficult to use if you have to figure out how to program it on your phone. But GoGo -Go Grandparent allows a loved one or even the person with Parkinson's to call the company and say, hey, I need to go to the grocery store at this time. They arrange for the ride and they can also notify a care partner that the person is on the move and that they've arrived. Um, if difficulty with texting, um, particularly since a lot of the phones have gotten smaller and the letters are so closely together now, that depth perception and that figure ground and just attending to all that stimuli can be difficult. So using a voice to text service like Siri on the iPhone, um, I think it's Cortana maybe on the Android, but there are a lot of those options now that if your speech is fluent enough, that can translate for you. Um, as far as losing things, that is a very common complaint with Parkinson's. Simple GPS tiles on an item that you're using all the time, like keys or a phone, can help compensate for that in finding something in a busy environment. And lastly, books on tape, such as even a service like Audible, if it's too much to attend to a book anymore, being able to listen to it and not have to think about the actual reading and staying focused can increase that leisure participation. If we look at how we can actually change the color or the contrast of something, that can increase participation as well. So we talked about eliminating background distraction. If that's not enough to take away that really patterned um, placemat for somebody to be able to focus on their bowl of food, if we add more contrast on the plate, getting a bright blue, a bright orange plate, that might allow them to notice the food better. If you think of, if you have your standard white dinner plate and there's mashed potatoes on it, that's a lot of white going on, that's hard to find. Adding more contrast to that allows the brain to focus better on where it actually needs to go. Increasing lighting can also increase the contrast, that color sensitivity, and reduce falls, as we discussed with using a, a nightlight in the hallway. Reducing the clutter, so less things to focus on and keeping the environment organized and consistent will really increase that functionality. Adding sensory input can also be very helpful. So a sensory cue for depth perception, such as instead of, hey, here's your pill, touch my hand, the pill is in my hand, gives them a cue of something to shoot for and lets them know when they're actually there versus more of that reaching and searching or a care partner can loudly tap on an item to help draw attention to it. Um, I've had someone tell me before that they have, say, a, a bowl of snacks that's always on the table, but the person's having a hard time with finding it. So adding just a little bit of that stimuli can help draw their eyes to what they actually need and disrupt that searching pattern. Also, if you increase resistance for that visual motor, 
So what that means is if we add some weight or some vibration or anything that increases the amount of um, input that they're getting, that can really help. So weighted pens and handwriting, weighted utensils and eating, those aren't just good for tremors. That can also really help with forming those letters and giving that sensation back to the hand for what it's doing. Lastly, and very important, those LSVT big exercises really depend on that proprioceptive input or that movement input. When we engage in those, we're training the body to move bigger and more efficiently, and that will carry over in improved depth perception and visual motor planning. So we discussed all the changes that we can make to promote vision, but another really important area is consult a specialist. So talking with OT and speech to design a plan to address perception deficits and integrate performance patterns, we can help specifically design a program for you. So working on skills such as basic things at home, word searching, puzzles, seek and find, spot the difference, those all came in our highlight magazines when we were younger. If you have those laying around for grandkids, bust them back out. That'll help sharpen those skills. More functionally though, model building, gardening, sorting household items, navigating while riding in the car or going for a walk, um, shopping at the grocery store, trying to find that one item within all those choices, lawn games, sports, card games. Those are all examples of how we can address visual perception in real life. We do have some time for questions. Yes. Yes. So the question was weighted pens. What are they and where can you get them? So weighted pens on the lower end you can actually make by just taking, say, a half size um, nut and stacking it up the pen. So that'll add a little bit of resistance to it. Or even just looking on Amazon, if you search weighted pens or pens for Parkinson's disease, you'll come up with this some of them are rather fat, some are skinny, but they are made of a heavier material that will provide that feedback. So one of the one of the vendors in the auto, um, excuse me in the vendor hall actually has a limited number of those weighted pens, so definitely walk around, ask about those, take advantage of the resources there. Okay. Before we wrap up, any other questions? I didn't see you, but go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. So what she was saying is Easter Seals has a lending library that can be very helpful. So if you contact them, you might actually find some of these things you're looking for. Yep. And if you're in the Des Moines area, you can actually visit. It's, it's um, uh, Camp Sunnyside. It's on the same grounds as Camp Sunnyside. It's just outside of Ankeny. And they have, or you can make an appointment to come in and they have a display and that you can actually see some of these things, try them mm -hmm. out. Um, they also have, for those that, because we know equipment is very, very expensive, they also have a program that can help with, with uh, used equipment as well. So they have um, a closet, oh, ha, they're pointing to me to go stand in front of the microphone. Um, I'm just so loud, Joe, that I didn't think I needed a microphone. Um, 
that you can go and borrow their equipment. Essentially, you pay a nominal fee, you use it as long as you need it, with the idea that when you're done using it, that you would return it back for somebody else to use. So that, that's with Easter Seals in the Des Moines area. Um, and, but it can be anywhere in the state of Iowa. So. So more of the dry, watery eyes, that would be more of a, a question to address with your physician. So it could be a relation to a Parkinson's drug or maybe blinking too frequently that they're dripping. But definitely speak to your physician if you're having difficulties with that. Your eyes can actually be dry and still tear a lot. It sounds <laughs> funny, but the, it, sometimes that is worth getting checked out because it could just be they need they're tearing up to try to keep it moist. Oh. Gosh. Oh, okay. Hi, about the uh, exercises like um, card playing or word play games that you suggested. Yeah. Are these shown to be preventative or at least to slow down the progression of this type of behavior, this type of activity? Or so the, did everyone hear the question okay? When we're looking at slowing things down, same as when we engage in those LSVT exercises, we're looking at sharpening those skills and keeping them good for as long as possible. So those games, if we can keep the brain active and keep those skills sharp, we can slow these things down. I don't have a study that will show a rate of slowing it down, but the longer we're using it and engaging it, we can keep it. Yes, sir. I have, for nine years, had prism glasses for, um, detect, for maybe to improve perception and far away. Okay. I also, and this is from the UCLA Jules Stein, or Stein uh, Education Facility at UCLA, so this wasn't, I mean, this is pretty secure that I was getting good advice, but these are glasses to wear within three feet. This is what I use for reading. Have you seen where prisms can be done on a bifocal basis? And I'm constantly changing my glasses. I'm not aware of prisms that will work on bifocals at this time, just because of how they have to change the prescription for the near and the far. When they add that etching or the adjustment, it can mess with that. I understand how that could be very annoying though. Have you spoken with a neurooptometrist recently? Yeah, so neurooptometry is more that specialization where they're still an optometrist or they're a neurologist, but they understand more how the brain and the eyes work together. Um, an example in this area would be Dr. Fitzgerald in Cedar Rapids or Dr. Raggi in Iowa City. I've had more success with them working with prisms for people that optometry generally wouldn't find helpful. They do a lot more of that evaluation of adding the stick on prism and seeing how it changes the person with their movement. So you may want to do just a quick Google search for neurooptometry or neuroophthalmology in your area. All right, we maybe have time for one more. We just had a question about the using this Siri to help with understanding of the phone so you don't have to type. Do you have any recommendations for apps that would work with that? Since Siri sometimes doesn't recognize the low speech. Yes, oh geez, I'm trying to think of what the app was actually called. I just downloaded one with a person serve recently. Um, I will find you and I will get back to you on that one. But we, how we actually found it was we looked on the uh, the app store on iPhone and searched for a dictation or a, uh, a meeting recorder, and it was super effective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it was me. Um, I think it's called Otter, O-T-T-E-R. Otter? Yeah. All right. We actually have time for a few more questions, so if, any, if there are any other questions, we will take them. Oh. We have a couple online questions, yeah. so we're going to give the mic back here. And we'll see what they are. Hi, guys. It's Gail McGahey. 
I hope you can hear me. Um, one of the questions is, is eyelid surgery good to consider for Parkinson's patients that have sagging eyelids? So that's definitely an option from what I've read through, and I have seen some people go through that. Um, it's a more permanent solution to what that eyelid crutch would be. So it's really up to the person if they want something invasive or if they want to more so try a temporary, temporary solution. Another question that's come through online is, can you talk a little bit more about LSVT and the impact on depth perception? Yes, so with LSVT, the brain essentially is lying to the person with Parkinson's disease. It tells them that they are moving large enough and effectively enough that they're gonna be able to do what they want to do, right? But functionally, when we see someone with Parkinson's disease go to reach for an item, they're seeing the item out here, but their brain is only telling them to reach a few inches. Even though that depth perception is giving them the feedback that it's far away, their body isn't registering that. So when we go through more of that large amplitude training, we can convince the brain to move larger and more effectively to go towards that target that it's already seeing. So it's more of a collaboration between the proprioception of the body and movement, and then also following the input that depth perception is giving. Yeah, even to add on, sorry, even to add on to the LSVT, um, sort of concepts is about that um, sensory mismatch okay. that can often happen. Sorry, I got the microphone, so. You yeah, know. I kind of figured it's Why okay. Don't you just come up with <laughs> so, Gail is one of the physical therapists that actually does the LSVT training in <laughs> Ankeny, and it's kind of her specialty. I mean, not really, but do you guys want to ask your question first and then I'll get into what I was going to say? <laughs> A comment. Large, most libraries have large print collections. And one thing we, my husband and I like to do is read the books. There it's more comforting. Flip your backs down. I think it's getting. It's more comforting. It's a little better. muffled. Yeah. Oh. Um, she is bringing up the fact that many libraries have large print books yes. that you can check out, and it'll make it a lot easier to read. Absolutely. A lot of libraries in the bigger cities, too, are allowing you to, I don't know the details on it, but you can check books out through Audible for free. Hi, I'm Gail McGahey, one of the PTs at On With Life. What, I, what, what Kate was saying about the LSVT com VT component, or even really just about Parkinson's, is there's a sensory mismatch. How big or how much force production that your body is actually moving. So as you are trying to reach for something, the depth perception is potentially still there, but the, the ability to have the force production to get the big enough movement to get to what you're trying to reach for. So there's that sensory mismatch is, is basically kind of how that plays in together. But very often, I mean, really, that's kind of the key to it is just, just it's not what you are perceiving or how your body is moving is not how you're actually um, producing the movement. So Gail, since you're already on the stage, <laughs> is there any more questions? Oh, we got another yes. question. What do you do for that mismatch? <laughs> there you go, Gail. Okay. <laughs> you know she's loving this, right? <laughs> no, <Quit>. not really. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for sensory mismatch? So. The, so we talk about big and we talk about loud, but really it's about reteaching your body what large amplitude movements mean. We are gonna be talking about this a little bit later, but the premise is, is that with Parkinson's, with the sensory mismatch, the movements get produced really, really small, really, really little, really, really slow, but that feels normal. That feels like when people say, stand up taller, move bigger, stop shuffling, you're like, I am, I'm fine. I'm doing just great because that's the sensory input that you get. When we produce a really, really large, over-exaggerated, ridiculous looking, almost cheerleader kind of, <laughs> kind of movement, you feel really, really crazily big, but what it does is it smashes the two together and it produces the normal movement. So you almost have to like trick your body 
into being really, really large to produce this over, over movement so that you can move normal. Does that make sense? Building on with that, when we do those LSVT exercises, we go through the large amplitude exercises to essentially calibrate for the moment, but then we follow it up with functional movement. So as you go through and you do the protocol, I'll then take you to the kitchen or take you to the cabinets, and we do the big reaching over and over so that it's programmed into the body and makes more sense. Any more questions, guys? All right, so since we have no more questions, Gail, don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, we've got a few minutes, right, before our next speaker. And so we want to, uh, of course, let you kind of get up and stretch. So I'm going to have Gail, well, you wanted to be on the spotlight. So I'm going to have Gail come back up here and lead you through a few stretches. But this is also a great time as I'm sure there's plenty of donut holes still out there. Because we honestly, we picked up a thousand donut holes this morning. So feel free to grab some donut holes and coffee. For those of you that just need to get up and stretch, I'm going to have Gail lead us through some stretches. And then, Joe, if you could grab the keynote speaker at this time, and we'll get that person queued up. Thanks. them if they move a little to the front or center, they might be able to hear on the Okay. So those that can't hear very well, if you want to move a little bit closer to the front and into the center, you might be able, and still social distance, you might be able to hear a bit better. We are going to switch mics as well so that you can actually, hopefully the mics will help us um, project a little bit better as well. But if you're staying in here and you want to stretch, yes? Okay. All right, so everybody stand up. Everybody stand up nice and big, right? There we go. Okay, first of all, take your hands, okay, and make your hands be as big as you can possibly get them. And if you think that's big enough, I'm going to tell you it's not big enough. Make it to the point where your hands are like, oh, golly, that stretching, that hurts so, so good, right? Now your hands are here. What I want you to do is take your hands to the back, and I want you to look up to the ceiling. Don't fall over. Don't fall over. And I want you guys to hold that for 10 seconds, and let's all count really loud and really big together. You ready? Go. One, two, louder, Three, more. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nice. Now bring it down and do a big slap here. Bring it back up here, big slap. There we go. All right, we're going to do it again. You're going to take your hands back. Be really, really big in your stretch. Look up to the ceiling as much as you can without getting dizzy. Make sure you're feeling that stretch across your chest and in your back, and go again with a count of 10. You ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Didn't everybody wake up a little bit? We were also just informed that the, the, um, this church system has a T-coil system in it. So if you have hearing aids that connect to T-coil, you can also connect to that system, and that may also help. So, all right, guys, we'll just give, give a few minutes to get mic'd up here. Feel free to take a little stroll, quick hike out, get some more donut holes, like I said, go to the bathroom, get a drink, come on back.
bring that down. It is muted right now. Okay. Don't be nervous. Hi, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started. So if you are visiting the exhibitors, you're welcome to keep visiting, but we encourage you all to come back to hear our keynote speakers. And to introduce our keynote speakers, we have Jill from Amniel to introduce those. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure to be with all of you today here and for all of those that are joining us virtually today. I think it's a testament to the fact that we all want to get out, learn more about Parkinson's disease, and thank you so much to On With Life for sponsoring this fantastic event. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Selena Brillman who joins us from the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center of the Silicon Valley, which is located in Northern California. She founded this clinic in 2017 with a vision to offer patients and their caregivers a healthcare model focused on improving quality of life by taking a holistic approach to care. Certainly, Dr. Brillman has a long list of degrees and experience but I do want to highlight her Midwest connection. Dr. Brillman was a pioneer in the development of deep brain stimulation when she was on the faculty at the University of North Dakota. So despite her roots being in California and Florida, she knows what a Midwest winter looks like. <laughs> so we appreciate that about her. Again, Dr. Brillman is, board cert is a board-certified neurologist, including a fellowship in movement disorders. So thank you, Dr. Brillman. Thank you. We're also very pleased to have Phil with us today. Phil is a Parkinson's patient, and he joins us from the state of Michigan, where he has worked as an award-winning automotive designer. Phil is a longtime athlete, you can tell, and has a great competitor spirit. 
Phil was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2015, and after his diagnosis, he tried to hide his symptoms, particularly at work, because he didn't want people to change their opinion of him or treat him differently. Phil started on Ritari in 2015 and is going to share his story and his journey with Parkinson's disease with you today. Dr. Brillman and Phil have an interactive presentation for you. It's entitled, Taking on Parkinson's Disease. And hopefully there'll be some time for questions at the very end. Before we get started, you should know this educational program will feature information from a healthcare provider and the personal experience of a person living with Parkinson's disease. This program is not intended to provide medical advice or care. We encourage you to talk with your own healthcare providers for questions about your personal medical condition or management. Out of consideration, Parkinson's, know someone with Parkinson's, are um, related to in some degree with Parkinson's, right? So Parkinson's is the fastest neurologic disorder um, in the United States um, and impacts millions of people and it just keeps growing. We don't know why some people have Parkinson's and others don't, um, but we do know that by the time a person has Parkinson's or has the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, they've lost about 50 to 80% of their dopamine producing neurons. So when we treat people with Parkinson's, our goal is to replace that dopamine so that the symptoms can improve. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a cure yet, though people are working very, very um, hard to get there. Uh, but we have very good symptomatic treatments now. I've been out of my fellowship for about 15 years now, and I can tell you that the treatments now that we have for PD are much better than they were back then. Um, we have a lot of our tools in our armamentarium, and it's really important that we bring the, um, the tools, that, that people know about those tools, and if you hear about something that you think might benefit you, it's important to be your own advocate, be an advocate for your loved one, and talk to your physician about that. I'm gonna keep stressing that because it's very, very important in this day and age. Um, you know, physicians don't have a lot of time with their, with, their, um, with their patients, and so it's so important to write down your symptoms and bring it to the attention of your, um, of your doctor. So the primary symptoms of, of Parkinson's, we used to think of it as just a motor disease of tremor, of slowness, of stiffness, but we know that there are non-motor symptoms as well, and those can be pretty debilitating um, to some people as well. So think about this. As you go by through your day, not that I wanted to consume your day, but think about those symptoms that affect you and what you think can be better. Next slide. So Phil, in what ways do symptoms impact your life and prevent you to, from doing things that you enjoyed? Well, um, as it progresses for me, I'm not able to do a lot of the things that I do for exercise. Um, tennis is hard, golf is hard. Everything has to be scheduled around your on and off time if you have it. Um, I think that's probably all I have. Okay, and then um, what? That's okay. So what? What ultimately made? What sort of symptoms made you ultimately seek your um, attention from from a doctor? Well, I was up north with my family one weekend, and we were all barbecuing and riding ATVs and swimming. And then later in the evening, when we were around the campfire, um, my daughter Hannah, who was 14 at the time, said, "Daddy, why is your hand shaking?" And I said, oh, you know, I, I blew it off and just handed her some more. And <laughs> did, she, did she accept that? She just took the s'more yeah, and moved well, on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she enjoyed her s'more. 
you know, I've, I've, had a, I've had a lot of success with, you know, dealing with the disease in everyday life. You wouldn't think so now, but... No, we know this is just a little picture. It's a little, it's a little picture. Yeah. So. so, is that me? <laughs> Good. It was probably me. And, uh, <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, can you tell us about the medicines that you took for PD? Uh, at first, I was on a, um, a carvalivodopa that was not time released, and I was able to use it effectively because my symptoms were light and uh, you know as, as my symptoms became more I needed you know I, I had discussions with the doctor about retiring because he had mentioned that something was coming and that this was about 2015 and when it, it did come, he, he, he suggested that I would I be on it. That's great. So yes, yeah, so so carbidopa levodopa is the mainstay. It's the gold standard in what we use in treatment of Parkinson's. Um, the immediate release carbidopa levodopa has been around since the 70s, and Ritari or an, um, a time release uh, carbidopa levodopa came out in 2015, and we're going to get into what, what the differences are. But how carbidopa levodopa works, or levodopa works in the brain, um, you can see that from the, the little cartoon here. Um, Carbidopa helps to decrease the breakdown of levodopa in the periphery, and levodopa converts to dopamine in the brain. And like I said, the whole motor problem with people with Parkinson's really is this decrease of dopamine. So the fundamental importance is increasing dopamine, and we do that by adding things like levodopa. It's the closest thing that we have to our own natural dopamine. Um, and so this will replace the dopamine. Um, much like, um, like Phil stated, um, early on people will, will use the immediate released carbidopa, levodopa, but over time that can become challenging. Next slide, please. Um, because people start to get what's called motor fluctuations. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these definitions, but when a person first starts taking um, levodopa, they have what we call the honeymoon period, where you don't really feel these off and on periods. You, you go about your day, your symptoms are pretty well controlled if you're at, a really, you know, at an optimal dose and you're able to, to perform your activities of daily living well um, without ups and downs. But over time, what happens is um, the, the medication doesn't, um, doesn't last quite as long, um, and you may have periods where the, you're, you've taken the medication, but you're not having that on time as well. So you've taken the medication, but your symptoms return during the day. And so as Phil said, you have episodes where you're starting to have to, you know, like um, make, the, make your, um, coordinate your day around the pills. And those are motor fluctuations, on and off. So on is when your pills are working well, and off is when they're not. Um, and this is very, very common. It can happen after two years, two to five years, about 40% at, fi at um, five years, about 70 to 90% at year 10. Um, in addition to this, people may have dyskinesia. And dyskinesia is when a person has involuntary sort of extra movements that they get. Um, and so this up and down is collectively called motor fluctuations. And there, it, there, oh, there's, there's really a lot of things that affect that. It can be 
um, how well you've slept. Absolutely. It can um, be what you've eaten. Yes. It's always good to have protein and not, not a lot of sugar, not a lot of uh, caffeine. Those things are affected. Absolutely. Um, right. Constipation can affect your yes. off periods yes. and make them worse. If you got to go potty. Yep, absolutely. You might have to plan that. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> There's so many factors. That is absolutely and right. It all has to be blended in the day to, to, for everything to work properly. That's right. Yes, it sure does. Um, so it's, um, it's quite a science, right? It is a science. <laughs> Uh, next slide, please. So, Phil, can you tell us what your on and off time was or is for you? Well, um, after I was after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I kind of took it lightly because at the time I was having all I ever had was light tremors, and my hand writing got a little smaller. But my my symptoms were fairly non-existent. My my life was so busy that I thought about the disease. When it was time for me to medicate, I just wanted to live life and live it to the fullest. I didn't want to be consumed by Parkinson's. That's the way. That's just the way I feel. That's great, and thank you for sharing that. Um, that's a that's a wonderful attitude, and I think that's super important. Attitude is. I hate to say I was in den I'm in denial, but it's best not to think about it when you're not dosing or. Right, and I, but I think there's a difference between being in denial and not letting it, you know, right. take over your whole life. Right. right. It's a nice balance. Um, so. Um, off time is so different for everyone. Um, I have people, my patients, who say, well, what's my off time like? Well, I can't tell you what your off time is like. That's something that people really need to sit down and think about. If it's something like tremor, that might not be so difficult to ascertain. Um, or stiffness, that might, that might show up in, um, oh, at, you know, at 11.30, if I take my medicines at 12, it might be harder for me to get out of a chair. I might have to start to push myself out of a chair, or it might be harder for me to get out of a car. Um, it may be real hard for me to get out of my you know, bed in the morning. That's it, um, early morning off times are very, very common. Um, people may be really slow in the morning to get ready for work, where it may have taken them 15 minutes, now it may take an hour, or an hour and a half. That's a big chunk of time that people are losing in their day. And when I say we have tools in our armamentarium, I'm not sitting here saying, okay, well, you know, you, you have this and we have nothing to do about it. We do have things that we can do to make that better. And that's why I'm sitting up here to, to educate, to let you know that, yes, we know that people have this, but we also have ways of helping. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, people have off periods where they have trouble speaking and communicating. They may freeze, um, and so it's difficult to get across the room. They, that can lead to falling, and that's a huge hazard. They um, may feel blue or depressed throughout the periods of the day. Um, some people get anxious and then they're put on an anti-anxiety medication, but it's actually because they have low dopamine during certain parts of the day. Um, so it's, it's really worth the exercise to think about how it affects you. And some of these symptoms are not just noticed by the person, but actually by their loved one or care person. Um, sometimes people don't recognize that they're not cognitively intact, but it's actually their loved one who sees that happening throughout the day. So it's worth sitting there with your, your significant other, your caretaker, whoever it is, to see is this happening um, in a pattern? Is it happening a couple of times a day? When is it happening? 
And timing is everything because it can be related to the timing of your medication. So it's worth the exercise, it's worth writing it down, everything's worth writing down and bringing it to the attention of your physician. I feel like right now I'm experiencing um, tremors based on the stress of putting on this mm -hmm. presentation because I had a great night's sleep. I had a great breakfast, and I, I'm pretty sure that if I wasn't at a, doing this presentation, I'd probably be at the gym. And you, you would never know that I had Parkinson's, right. or you know, you would look at me like, like that, that 60 year old guy. He's in pretty good shape, you know. <laughs> so it's just an, it's just an example of um, how the effects are, and what what what, what we can do to, you know, make them better or, or ignore them or... Absolutely. Yep. That's right. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, it, it is important to think about the areas of life that affect you. What areas can be better? Does it, is it, is it getting dressed in the morning? Is it taking a shower? Um, is it getting ready for work? Do you feel tired at certain parts of the day? Um, in 2014, the Michael J. Fox Foundation did a survey of 3,000 pe uh, people with Parkinson's, and over 90% of, of the people said that they had one hour of off time per day. And 65% said that they had two hours of off periods per day. And 20% um, said they had four hours. So it's, you know, sometimes I just, I ask my patients, how are you doing? And everybody says, oh, I'm fine. But if you really think about it, there is room for improvement if you really, really think. And if you think about it and not accept things as your new norm, because there are ways of helping the situation. Uh, next. So again, thinking about how people, um, how their off periods can impact um, one's life. Um, communicating, hygiene, getting around the house. And most people said that the most troublesome were tiredness, slowness. So many people say that the fatigue is really very, very difficult for them. Reduced dexterity, so they have trouble with buttons, writing down things, using their mouse. Um, and then the early morning is, is something that, if you really think about, is a problem. And many people just slough it off as, oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting slower because I'm getting older. But maybe it's, that's not it. Maybe it's actually because of, of PD, and that can be, can be helped. Um, next, next slide. I can't stress this enough. Um, it is so incredibly important to, to talk to your primary care, uh, to your um, healthcare professional about your symptoms. Whether you think they're related to PD or not, bring it to the attention of your, of your healthcare professional. Because if we don't know what you're experiencing, we can't help. So it's super, super important. Um, make a list as it's going by. And, and let them know at your, at your, um, your appointment. Um, and if it's something that's very troubling, you don't wait until your appointment. Um, it's your health, and so you deserve, that's why we're here, that's why doctors are doctors, to help. So um, it's super important to bring it to the attention of your physician. Um, and then really important too is to bring a family member or a spouse or someone because I can't tell you how much more information I get when, when the loved one comes. Because I don't know about you, but when your doctor asks how are you, do you say fine? If I had a dollar for every fine I got, I would be so rich. Uh, it's unbelievable, yeah. Well, I think, I think that I'm probably on the, on the cusp of maybe a, a dosage increase because I shouldn't, I really shouldn't be having the tremors that I'm having here. And, you know, like I said, most of, most of the rest of my day will probably be pretty smooth. 
So when you see your doctor, are you going to say, I think yes. it? Okay, well, good. You're I not need to say come see you because I think I need an increase in my medication. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid. Exactly, exactly right. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's, that's correct. It's not, it's not a bad thing. No, it's not. It's just about helping and making those little adjustments to make things smoother. That's the whole point is smooth. We don't want to see you go through this. We want this. So next slide, please. How did you discuss your off time with your doctor? Well, like I said, I, I need to talk to him about my off time. And, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, it'll, be real, it'll be a real short conversation because he knows what we go through when we're off. And, uh, you know, life is better when we're on. So yeah. talk to your doctor. Right. So what was the first conversation like? Did, did you already know about Raitari? Did he bring it up? Did you bring it up? Oh, well, you said like, he brought it up. Like everybody, they think that they're a doctor because of the internet, you know. So <laughs> I, had, I had diagnosed my um, condition before I even went and saw him. And sure enough, you know, he, he made some neurological testing and, and told me that I had Parkinson's. So you weren't that shocked? It no. was more of a confirmation? More of a confirmation, yes. Got it. Got it. And then when he, when he brought up the, the idea of Raitari, what were your expectations and were they met? Um, you know, I was pretty lucky because the dose that I was, I'm taking now was the right dose for me. And uh, I have, I've heard a lot of stories from people that have a hard time they, they, they went back to the old levodopa and, um, and then they go back to the retiree and they had great success with it. So um, just make sure you talk to your doctor and um, even though it's frustrating, stick with it and it'll probably, you'll probably have good results. That's a great point. So we're going to get into the mechanism of Ritari, but one very important point is that the communication between the doctor and the patient when switching over to Ritari, it's very important that there be um, communication um, very early on about how the person is doing once they switch. So Ritari isn't something that one should get a prescription for and say, I'll see you in six months. There, there needs to be um, a really you know, close follow-up by the physician or the staff to say, is it working? Is, is the dose um, good enough? Is it too little? Is it too much? And is it lasting long enough? Um, because like you said, um, a lot of people will say this doesn't work and then they'll go back to their old um, carbidopa, levodopa. And this will work. It's just a matter of finding that right dose. And, and you'll see in the, in the clinical studies, 75% of people didn't get it right at the first dose, but just with a little tweak, we can get it right. And it's worth the, the tweaking and that communication. Yes. Um, okay, so um, Ritari is carbidopa levodopa. It's the same ingredients. It's just in a different formulation. It is indicated for Parkinson's disease. Um, and um, we're going to get into the technology of it in the next slide, please. So it is based in, um, it's a unique combination of a capsule with these special beads, and a third of them are of the immediate release and two-thirds of the extended release. And the immediate release are, um, are released first, and you feel them first, and then the, the um, uh, extended release after that and then they can last up to about five hours in the person depending on how long they've been in um, on uh, on the immediate release um, carbidopa levodopa just depends on the person and next uh, next slide so this slide shows um, shows the difference in the bloodstream between Ritari and the other formulations of carbidopa levodopa. So for those of you who are um, familiar with the yellow cinemats, that would be the, uh, the first green, um, the green 
first sort of peak. Um, and then the other ones would be the extended release and then the, I guess it's the blue one, is the uh, Stelevo, and that's the Carbidopa, Levodopa, and Entacapone. The purple is the Ritari, and so you see that that stays with you longer, and that helps to, to um, avoid those, those valleys and, and the um, ups and downs for a longer period of time that people would get otherwise with those other formulations of Carbidopa, Levodopa. Uh, next. So in terms of safety, um, safety, so it's, it is carbidopa levodopa. We would expect the same thing as we would get with carbidopa levodopa. And we're going to go into the specifics of Ritari in just a moment. Next. In the clinical trials um, of Ritari, we found that, and that what they did was they compared the Carbidopa levodopa, 25 over 100, to Ritari, and they found that people had two time the reduction of off periods as compared to the regular Carbidopa levodopa. And there was also two times the increase in on time without dyskinesia as compared to the regular Carbidopa levodopa. They also did other scales to see if it helped with quality of life and that kind of stuff and um, activities of daily living, not quality of life, excuse me, um, daily living. And, and there was improvement there as well. Next slide. They recently um, did a comparison to see, does it help per dose? Um, is it better per dose? Um, was there improvement? And there was per dose of levodopa, carbidopa levodopa for the immediate release versus Ritari, and there was an improvement of 1.2 hours. So that's pretty impressive as well in that you get more time uh, per dose um, of Ritari as well. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the side effect profile is similar um, to the immediate release car um, carbidopa levodopa. And basically anything that can increase dopamine, you, you could have the um, possibility of falling asleep. You, one could have dyskinesia, uncontrolled urges, things like that. So anything that, you know, nausea, headache, anything that you, could, that you have with immediate release carbidopa levodopa, one could have with uh, this as well. Next slide. So how long did it take you to get to the right dose of Ritari? Did you got it right off the bat? Is that what you're saying? Wow, that's awesome. That's <laughs> such a good, you know, that happens to me, and it, it, you just feel so great when that happens. Yeah. And you've been on the same dose since then? Yes. And, and that's great. And uh, that's why I'm really wondering maybe I should... Yeah, and you know, Increase. after six years, um, it doesn't, it's not, that's a long time. that is a long time. That absolutely is a long time, and that's about average for being on the same dose of Ritari. Yes. So it doesn't, yeah. Um, that's fantastic. And then how did you feel? How did you know that was the right dose of Ritari? Well, you know, I really haven't experienced a lot of symptoms like I have in the last six months. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I've, 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 if aside from uh, occasional tr tremors and s uh, small handwriting, um, I, I barely had any any of the symptoms, and now we're do, we're getting into all the uh, all the other symptoms. Yeah, a little adjustment, and you'll uh, get ready to go. So. Um, Great. Um, so people often ask, well, why do I need a higher dose of Ritari? And did you wonder the same thing as well? Like, why did I need the numbers were different? Well, it, it just made sense to me that, you know, I, I may need, I mean, it may need to increase because of, the, of what I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. So um, when we dose Ritari as compared to um, immediate release carbidopa levodopa, there's no one-to-one -one, um, switch. 
So, and I think this graph shows it pretty nicely. Um, if you see here with the, the green, you see the immediate release um, and it goes up and then it goes down over time. But when you see the, the purple Raitari, you sort of, you, you need, it's a stacking effect. So it's, it's three of the 95 milligram um, Raitari to get to the, to get to the concentration of levodopa, but it lasts so much longer. Um, so that's really the reason why one needs to take more in the way of milligrams, but they're not, they're not comparable. Um, and then it comes, next slide, comes in different dosages. Um, so, and you'll see that in just a moment. So again, I had alluded to this before that it's very, very important that once you do get switched over, uh, if you do get switched over, that you have an open communication with your doctor or their office um, because, like I said, 75% uh, of the people in the clinical trial needed a, a dose adjustment, whether they were a little too high or a little too low. Um, so you want to have that open communication within one to three days. I usually do three days. Um, and, and sometimes my patients say, you know what, I need a couple of more days to see how I'm really feeling. And some people say, you know what, um, it's a little too high or it's too, a little too low, or as in Phil's case, we nailed it. So um, just depends on the person. Um, next slide, okay. And so as you see, it comes in four different dosages. So once your dose is found, your healthcare provider may be able to um, decrease your pill burden to adjust to one of the higher doses. In other words, if you're taking two of the 95 milligram capsules, they may be able to switch it to one of the 195 capsules um, to decrease that pill burden once your dose is, um, is found. So that's nice. And, and as practitioners, for us, it gives us a lot of flexibility to find that right dose and to really dial it in, um, which is, is part of the reason why I'm, I really like this medication so much, too. OK. Um, all right. And that is more, oh, so in terms of um, how to take it, you can take it with or without food. It should not be crushed, but if a person has problems swallowing, you can open the capsule and put it over applesauce um, or, you know, um, something to that effect and then eat it uh, right away. So, um, Phil, could you tell us, um, as we're closing things up, what else can you share about your experience, please? Well, the, the hardest part about living with Parkinson's for me is no longer being the best at what I do in many aspects of my life. It's a new humbling experience for me and I'm doing the best not to let it bring me down. The truth is even with Parkinson's I feel more fortunate than most because even though I recently stepped back from my work I'm still finding ways to remain active and always looking forward to what's next. That's great. And, um, and so let's take a few minutes, next slide please, um, to talk about um, how you can live he healthfully with PD. This is very, very important. You know, like I said, we talk about adding dopamine, but these other factors are very, very, very important. So sleep is supremely important, as Phil said. He slept well. Um, but two out of three people with PD have issues with sleep. So it's super important to have good sleep hygiene, um, to make sure that, that the um, environment in your bedroom is well. And people who don't sleep well tend to, have, those can affect your symptoms the next day. So if there are problems with sleep, bring that to the attention of your physician as well so that they can get to the root of what's causing the problems with sleep. Is it restless legs? Is it REM sleep behavior disorder? Is it insomnia? Are you anxious about things? Are you having off periods at night? So these kinds of things need to be um, delved into as well. Eating well um, is important too. Um, having a balanced diet um, with protein and lean fats and fruits, vegetables, 
um, antioxidants, that kind of thing, super important. Lots of water. Nobody's thirsty. Nobody ever wants to drink anything because nobody wants to go to the bathroom. But water is very, very, very important. We must flush our system. It's important for our, our organs and it's important for blood pressure and to keep our, our uh, bodies well hydrated. Even without Parkinson's. Exactly right, <laughs> absolutely. Everybody knows that. Right? Yep. And the next one, even without, all of these without Parkinson's really, um, but exercise. Exercise cannot be, we can't state this enough. It's, you will sleep better. Yes. And prognostically, it makes a difference for your Parkinson's. It will decrease um, falls. It will make your balance better. It, it, it's better for your cognition. It is so incredibly important to exercise. Um, their studies have shown that, so there's no disputing that. And really um, do what, what will motivate you. So we can't stand here and say, oh, you know, you should you know, get on a treadmill, well, you know, whatever it is. Whatever motivates you is what should be done, really. And then stress management. I mean, that's really, really important. So I've seen some of my patients who are extremely stressed out by either job or home, whatnot. Um, whatever a person can do to decrease their stress is really going to help their, their PD. And, and, you know, we don't live in a bubble, and we get that. Um, there's a lot of stressors in the world and in life. But whatever one can do to decrease that, and sometimes exercise is a good stress reliever too. So that, that's really important uh, as well. Next slide. So um, I want to thank you, Phil, for joining us and for sharing with us your, your insights and, and your story about PD and, and Raitari. Um, I, am, I hope you understood and learned that Ritari is carbidopa levodopa, and it's a longer acting formulation that may help to reduce your off periods and increase on um, periods without dyskinesia. And, um, and really important that if you do start Ritari that, that you have that open communication with your provider and again, really super um, vital is writing your symptoms down, whether it's about um, off, whether it's about on, non-motor symptoms, motor symptoms, whatever the case may be, write it down, bring it to the attention of your healthcare provider so that they can help you um, be the best you you can be. Um, next slide. All right, Jill, would you like to speak to this? Sorry, there, there it goes. Okay, perfect. So managing Parkinson's disease isn't something that anyone should have to do alone. And that's why Amnial Pharmaceuticals developed the MyRitari patient support program. This program offers a range of resources, including information on financial assistance, and is designed to make it easier for people to access Ritari. The goal of the program really is if you're started on Ritari and it's working for you, we want to help you find a way to stay on Ritari. How's the program work? Well, everyone who enrolls is assigned a dedicated case manager, and that dedicated case manager can do things like perform a benefits investigation to help you understand your specific insurance coverage and how much Ritari is likely to cost if you go and pick it up at the pharmacy. The case manager is also going to tell you about affordability options that you may be eligible for, including a Ritari copay savings card. Um, if you all would uh, like to stop at my exhibit table, I have some great information on the My Ritari patient support program. I also have some nice pouches that provide information just in general about Parkinson's disease, including the importance of what both uh, Dr. Brillman and Phil were saying about keeping track of your symptoms and the importance of making sure that those are jotted down so that when you do have an opportunity to speak with your healthcare provider, you can be specific about that. And the last thing I have at the table are some great weighted pens so that if you're like Phil and have some difficulty writing occasionally, 
those might help you, and those are a free giveaway uh, for being here today. With that being said, I think that we're willing to open it up for some questions. Is that right, Dr. Brillman and yep. Phil? Okay. Rick, we have a mic here. We got a couple questions online first. We'll do those. <coughs> so, go ahead. <laughs> I can do it. Okay. Um, has there been any success with medication implant and um, and PTS able to adjust med dose remotely to increase during off times? Like, um, I'm not gonna know how to pronounce these words. Baclofen pumps for MS. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. <laughs> Could you repeat that, please? Um, has there been any success with medication implant and PTS able to adjust med dose remotely to increase during off times? Does that make sense? Oh, I think that um, has there been success in remotely increasing medications for off time? I think so. Oh, but a baclofen pump? That was an example. Okay. so. Remotely, um, so so MS is a, is a different scenario, right? It's a different neuro neurological condition. But in terms of um, Parkinson's disease, um, certainly we can do things remotely via telemedicate telemedicine. Um, we can make adjustments uh, via telemedicine for our oral medications. We can do, there, if a person has deep brain stimulation, we can, there is one company that can do an adjustment um, for DBS remotely as well. Um, and then there is, for those of you who don't know about the Duopa pump, which is an intestinal gel, that cannot be done remotely. Um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> they, could be better off on, on Ritari. I, I mean, I happen to, I'll, I'll be honest, 99% of my patients are on Ritari that take levodopa because I just think it's a, a personal choice, of course. Um, it's a better product, but that's my own personal, that's not, I'm not representing the rest of the neurology um, <laughs> doctors, um, but if you know if you if your loved one is having off periods, one could ask um, if they would be a candidate for it. The worst they can say is no. Yes. I'm looking at the agenda, and it looks like there was a, a talk on taking on uh, PD here, but. It, the last half hour seemed like a commercial for Ritari. I don't see that on here. Well, we want to take. Well, we want to encourage people to take on their disease and be an advocate for themselves. Um, personally, I, I happen to think that Ritari is a way to do that because people get more on time and get more out of their their lives and their days. But we could. We should have something up there for. Amitadine for those that have movement issues, and I'm sorry, I just I just didn't see it. Um, I took Ritari for four years and went back to carbidopa, levodopa in the basic sense, and so I, I I just was confused. Thanks. Sure, thank you. We have another question back here. Thank you. I have two symptoms that are especially concerning to me. I'd like to find out if there is a non-medicinal way to treat them to enhance my life. One of them is slurring speech. Another is stiffness in legs. I have been a runner almost all my life. As Phil, I'm sorry, is that your name, Phil? Your guest, your ambassador? Athlete most of my life. I used to run marathons, the whole works. Now I, I will walk maybe two miles a day, every day. And I try to mix in a little bit of running with that. But when I run, I find I can only go for maybe a block, half a block. My legs start to feel so stiff, I'm afraid I'm going to trip and fall and I have to go back to walking. And I alternate walking and running. Is there anything medicinal, I can, non-medicinal thing I can do to strengthen my legs to improve that ability to walk longer, run longer, without tripping, falling down, and to enhance the slurred, the slurred speech? Yeah. 
Um, have you been diagnosed with PD? Yes. You want to answer that? So retiree is not working? Or? I don't know. He said non-medicinal. Do you have any trip, uh, tips uh, for non-medicinal? Just, you know, for, for me, it's the balance of, of uh, the gut and eating and, you know, the, the, it seems like if I try and play 18 holes of golf, I can. I used to be able to get through five hours with one dose, and now I, I feel I feel like it's. I need at least two doses during that five-hour period. So that may be something that you might have to do is maybe take a dose in in the middle of in the middle of your walk or your run. So is there anything? Do you do you do extra stretching or? extra anything to get you through is there any it's, being it's, an most, athlete? it's mostly just you know like hydration and you know it's just trying to trying to do everything that you would normally do but maybe you have to do it a, you know sooner or you know drink more or it's hard to say yeah Uh, so hold on just a second. Sorry. Let me just, I'm going to address that just a little, just a little bit. Sorry to interrupt. No, please. So from a non-medicinal standpoint, slurred speech. So we think about, um, we kind of go back to that loud or speak out or whatever. So therapeutic intervention for slurred speech, for being able to actually get that large amplitude, large production of voice can help with slurred speech. So definitely talk to us about loud or just about large amplitude with voicing. So if you haven't done anything like that. The other thing to think about is sort of like, so you want to continue exercising, that's awesome. Yes, please do. Large amplitude movements, again, but Consider when you're taking your medication as to when you then go out and exercise. So you know when carbidopa, levodopa, when you first start that dosing, it takes about, about 30 to 60, maybe 90 minutes is at your peak when you have the maximum amount of carbidopa, levodopa in your system. And so you don't want to go exercise when you're on your down peak, when it's beginning to wear off. So it's a lot about planning and pacing as to when did I take my meds, when do I need to get out there and do my activity. So a lot of that can also be if you're not sure about when you're doing what and when you should, is thinking about having a motor journal. Journal. When did I take my medication? When did it begin to kick in? What kinds of activities am I trying to do? So that you're sort of paying attention to your signs and symptoms as well, so that you can get out there and be as active as possible non-medicinally. The other thing you also want to think about too is there's a lot of research about cycling and the idea of cycling to sustain those large amplitude reciprocal movements, so with your stiff legs, that also might help you as well. And that, okay, and if you guys heard that, he talked about interval training, and what you said was that it worked for him, right? Interval training, which is changing the intensity of your workout. If you're walking, maybe you speed up your walk for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, then go back to your normal pace, speed it up again, slow down, speed up, slow down, alternating your normal pace with whether it be walking, running, cycling, whatever, with something that is more intensified for a period of time. That helped me initially. Now, I don't see as much change. So that's why I'm curious if there's something physical I can do aside from the medicine and timing the medicine off. If there's something physically I can be doing to um, enable, my, enable me to be able to last longer as I run or walk. There yes. is, um, this is medicinal, but um, there are on-demand medications now that are available too that you can use when needed. Um, so for something like that, if you wanted an extra oomph while you're doing, you know, an exertion such as 
running or something, you, one could use an on-demand medication. It's not non-medicinal, but it's something. <laughs> Hi, I, I've got a couple tips that might help him. Um, first off, my, my levodopa kicks in best after 45 minutes of taking it. That was kind of my hi highlight. So that's when I start my run, which I run every day between two and a half and four miles. And Yeah, <clears throat> that's awesome. And the uh, other thing I'd, I'd add is if you have a le access to a leg press machine, you know, the leg press to push out, you get, have, have a goal to, to get to half your weight. So if you weigh 150, you, you want 75 pounds as your build up ultimate weight to push on the, on the leg press machine. It's the, your legs will get a lot stronger in a hurry and you'll, the, you're, you're worried about the, the upper part of your leg and it'll, it'll strengthen it quite a bit and that'll help you. <clears throat> I really have to focus, I have to think hard. Thank you, sir. I really have to think very hard about lifting my knees, pushing my heel forward. I used to be able to zone out, listen to my music, and just run for relaxation. Now I have to concentrate so hard. Pardon me? You can do that yeah. <laughs> but uh, is there something I can do that I don't have to concentrate quite so hard? Thinking every second about, am I lifting my knee, am I lifting my pushing my heel forward, am I, how am I running? What is my form like? Every second I'm running, that's more tiring than the running itself. Thank you, again. Yeah, and actually, actually, so I'm on my, on my wrist watch here, I'm getting some texts from some of our people in Ankeny that are our Parkinson's person served, and one of them had said um, water aerobics really, really found that water aerobics was um, very, very helpful in terms of not feeling like you're gonna fall, but being able to get enough cardio and enough reciprocal activity. So water aerobics was great as well. So just a little tidbit. Okay, that is a question for Dr. Brillman. Say that again. Basically, I heard that there you can add add uh, more uh, uh, prescription when you have a, a physical activity that you're going to be doing. What, what kind of does that just add more carbonyl dopa? Or? No, there's three medications that are now available for on-demand use that people utilize if they're starting to wear down, but they don't want to add more to their baseline meds. So some people use it when they're exercising, some people use it if they're starting to go down in between, that kind of thing. Um, but like for exercise, um, so if the person's exercising and they want a little bit extra, say added to their, like in my patient's case, to add it to their Raitari, they'll use one of their one of the on-demand medicines, such as an inhaled levodopa or um, an injection of um, apokin, which is a dopamine agonist. So there's, like I said, lots of tools in the armamentarium, um, and that will enhance their on, and then they feel like they can either do the boxing better or they can work out more effectively um, because it enhances their on time. Oh yeah, you're the exerciser. You, that's another thing you're going to ask your doctor. <laughs> yeah, there's a question back there as well. I'm getting my exercise in doing this, aren't I? First of all, thank you both very much for sharing your day with all of us. A uh, question about because diet is so important, whether you have Parkinson's or you don't. Um, and a lot of mention of avoiding the sugar and protein being very important. But I have read bits of literature that um, try to reinforce avoiding protein 
um, directly with your intake of your carbidopa levodopa, so like taking it an hour before a meal or an hour after a meal, and I'm wondering how that works with the Riteri that's like time released right. w throughout the day with your meals, or is there any impact at all on that? Because I definitely see it, Gary's on the traditional carbidopa levodopa, and I, and I definitely know if, if I don't give it to him, I mean, if I give it to him like with his eggs and his bacon in the morning, it, it totally loses its effectiveness. Sure. Um, can you address that, please? Yes, of course. So basically, um, levodopa is, um, is absorbed in the small intestine at the same point where, place where there's the protein absorption and there's competition there. And so there is about 20% absorption, a uh, decrease absorption um, when a person uses levodopa and, and um, consumes protein at the same time. Depends on the person, how long they've had PD, what the gut is like, because there's a lot of changes in the gut of a person with Parkinson's. There's slowness in the motility and that kind of, that kind of thing that happens. Um, so people that are early on don't necessarily notice these things, but as time progresses, there's certainly, they notice changes. And some of my, I mean, I've had patients that I've had PD for 20 years, and if they have more than four ounces of steak, their right tire is not gonna work at all. So it really just depends on the person. Um, basically, in the morning, it's better to take the medication on an empty stomach. Um, as the time, you know, as the day progresses, you, it doesn't have to be as diligent as one, you know, on a totally empty stomach, because that could be very problematic, of course. And it is whether you're taking the IR or any, you know, any type of levodopa product. Um, but it really depends on that person and how it, it's gonna, they're going to um, do with the Raitari. Basically, however, when a person takes Raitari, they're taking it less frequently than they are taking the immediate release. Um, just because of how long it lasts. So that gives you more wiggle room in terms of meals. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But it's not like you have to, you know, wait the hour and do that kind of thing as much um, with Raitari versus the IR. But it's still a problem depending on the person. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> So dosing of the Raitari, is that like a daily dose, a twice a day dose? Or and so it's a, it's a minimum of three times per day. Okay. But if, you're convert, if it's being converted from a person who's already taking um, immediate release, it really depends on how often they're taking their immediate release. In general, if a person's taking it four times, usually they can go to three times. Okay. Um, but again, it just depends. So I ascertain that when I speak to them and say, is it lasting long enough? And they may have to still do four times, but I would say, you know, at least 85 to 90% of the time, they can go down to three, three times per day, but just because of how long it, it lasts. But if, if it's someone who's never been, the minimum is three times per day. I was going to say, because I'm not around him all the time, and he always says he takes his medicine, but I don't see that it's working, so I don't know about compliance, but it seems like with Ritari, you could become more compliant, because he takes a certain amount in the morning, a different dose at the afternoon, and then another different dose, and then at nighttime, it's another different dose. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, I'd go bonkers with it, but... You know, I want, I want to make it simple for him, but, and there's no contraindications whatsoever with a DBS? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, definitely not. Because that's I mean, for more the tremors. And right. And so, you know, as you know, the majority, if not everybody, most everyone with DBS needs to eventually be, I mean, they need to be on their medicines still anyways. And so, yes, we use it with DBS. Okay. We use it with all the medicines with Parkinson's disease, the orals, and yeah. Well, thank you. This has been very informative. Oh, good. Very. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to say thank you, you know, as a care partner, because this helps me understand 
so much, you know, of what, why he's doing what he's doing, you know, instead of, like initially I noticed him shuffle, you know, and I thought, why doesn't he just pick up his damn feet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, so, so I really appreciate it as a caretaker. The other thing I heard early on when he was initially diagnosed, it might have been 10 years ago, I don't know, but they said with Parkinson's, they, take, they start with the minimum amount of medication, and then you have to... All Parkinson's, carbidopa levodopa will always work. The problem, though, is the motor fluctuations. And so <clears throat> it will work, but the window for each dose gets smaller. And it gets smaller because of the way the immediate release works. That's one thing. Also because of the, the slowness of the motility of the gut, because of the, the emptying of the stomach. So we see that in people with Parkinson's, after years of having Parkinson's, pills can get stuck in their stomach after an hour and a half of taking it. So they need it to get to the small intestine, but it's just sitting in the stomach, so nothing's going on, and that's why they're still off. So, um, and then also because further loss of the dopamine producing neurons. So all those things together make it so that the immediate release, that window gets smaller and smaller. So it will always work, but that's why companies are trying to make better formulations of levodopa so that it lasts longer, so that the person gets access to it better. Um, so it will work. Uh, and that's why we're lucky to have newer and better formulations of the old medication that is the gold standard that works the best and is the closest to what we have or make. Yes. Um, I've been uh, diagnosed for 16 years, and so it's been a while, mm -hmm. and I've progressed from medications with uh, the immediate release, originally I was taking them about every three hours, and it's hard to work in your your meals in there when you're doing it that frequently. Okay, but now I've switched over to Ritari, which I've been taking for about five years, and uh, the thing that I've found is that it, it works good for me, but I think that, that does not negate the uh, plotting, if you will, of on times and off times to know when to take it and how long it's really lasting for you. I'm at the uh, 48195s, okay? So I'm, I'm, I guess that's sort of a plug for Ritari, if you will. Yeah, as, as much as the, the plotting, or I should say, grafting of the on times and off times so that you understand what the medication is doing for you or isn't doing for you. Right, and so like, like we were talking about, it's pretty common, right? So after a few years, people need an adjustment. That's, you know, your body changes, and so you're, likely going to need a change over time, like a small tweak. Um, so it's not uncommon that over, you know, five years, four or five years, there's going to need to be an adjustment over time. Um, but thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, absolutely. We have one online question, and then we are going to end this session. And then we, I believe Dr. Brillman will be available for questions out in the atrium. Okay, how does a PD patient deal with a high need for protein for osteoporosis, weak bones, and being a lightweight person, but that conflicting with their medications? How does a PD patient know what? How does a PD patient with osteoporosis deal with the high need for protein and it conflicting with their meds? So they need lots of protein, but it's conflicting with their meds. So the osteoporosis should be the vitamin D. It shouldn't 
the a protein issue. Um, the one thing that one could do, though, is that would be one way around it, um, depending on how often they're taking their PD meds, which could be a, an issue. Um, another alternative could be utilizing medications that are, are bypassing the oral route, such as if they're taking a lot of oral levodopa, maybe con contemplating getting um, a duopa pump or DBS, and if they're not taking a lot, maybe utilizing a patch, um, uh, that kind of that thing. Thank you, and we are going to, let's give them a big round of applause for that. Thank you very much, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Jill, did you have anything else that you want? Okay. So we are going to bring in Chris Cameron now. If you are local, you probably know Chris. She's one of the um, kind of area gurus on Parkinson's disease, and she's wonderful. She leads several of our support groups. Come on in, Chris. And we know you've been sitting for a while, so feel free to get up, use the restroom, visit the exhibitors. But for those of you in the room and online who want to, Chris is going to lead us in some exercises. You've heard several times today from several of our speakers, and you'll continue to hear it about the importance of exercise. So we wanted to give Chris... Thank you. Give us two minutes while we switch mics real quick. You're going to have to move it up. Oh, there you go. Is she on? Okay. There. Hey. It works. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It is still morning, so good to see some familiar faces I haven't seen for a long time. <laughs> All right, well, what we're going to do, I'm just going to give you guys a little stretch break before you go out and do uh, get your lunch and continue with the program. So um, for those of you who can stand up, go ahead and stand. If you need to have a seat, I'll, we'll do some of these in the chair as well. So make sure you have to you. We're going to kind of stretch out here, stretch the arms. Let's reach up, take a nice big deep breath in. Exhale, circle the arms down. Good, again, inhale, big reach up. And exhale, circle the arms down. All right, let's keep those arms down. We're just gonna slowly turn your head and you can look over your right shoulder or your left, whichever one. We're gonna switch it over to the other side, nice and slow. Those neck muscles are really stiff. Turn slowly to the right again. And back to center. And turn your head to the left. And back to around to the front. Good. Again, inhale, open out and back. Exhale around. Good. One more time. Open up. All right, now this time you're gonna bring your arms around. We're gonna take your right arm on top of your left. You're gonna give yourself a big hug here. Hold on to either your shoulders or kind of behind on your low back or on your upper back. And then you're gonna hold this and drop your chin down and kind of curl forward. This is a nice stretch, opens up the shoulders and the upper back. Good, now let's take it up, open the arms out again. And then we're gonna take that left arm on top. Give yourself a big hug, drop the elbows down, chin down, round forward. Deep breath in and exhale. Good, come up again. One more time, open it out nice and big. All right, let's stretch the arms out, turn your palms up and then we're gonna tap the shoulders, extend the arms out. So really try to straighten your arms as much as you can. Good, breathe, inhale and exhale. 
All right, one more time. Good, keep those arms out. We're gonna bring them around to the front and let's do some little palm turns here, up and down. Good. All right, excellent. Now let's drop the arms down by your sides. We're gonna take the right arm and reach it up, or your left, either one. <laughs> reach it up and over. Really reach up towards the ceiling. You're gonna reach up there and touch the lights above you. Good. Exhale, bring it up and over. Inhale. And exhale. Good. Those side muscles get really tight. Reach it up and over one more time. And down. Good. Last one. All right. Very good. And down. All right. We're going to work some muscles here. We're going to take the arms out in front of you. Palms facing each other. Drop your shoulders down away from your ears. So a lot of times, you know, we kind of are like this. So let's kind of roll those shoulders back and down. All right, now from here, let's pull the elbows back, kind of keep them close in, squeeze the shoulder blades together, and then reach out as far as you can. Good, inhale, pull back, squeeze. Exhale, reach forward. We're gonna do about six of these. Inhale, pull back, squeeze those shoulder blades. Reach it out. Good, three more. Good, keep breathing, don't hold your breath. All right, one more time. Reach it out, pull back, squeeze, hold it here. We're gonna squeeze those shoulder blades together, drop the shoulders down. Good, and drop the arms down, shake them out. All right. Now, one more thing we're gonna work here on the upper body. We're gonna take the hands up. Open your fingers nice and wide. Kind of think about spreading all your fingers apart as wide as you can. Now, we're gonna make a fist. Open the hands again. Stretch, stretch, stretch those fingers apart. Good, do that again. And open up nice and wide. All right, good. Now this time I'm gonna have you take your thumb across your palm, wrap your fingers around your thumb. We're gonna circle the wrist around. Good. And then other direction with your circle. All right, excellent. And open the hands up again, and then just shake them out. Okay, good. All right, if you're standing, get your feet just comfortable, kind of shoulder width apart. We're just gonna do some little weight shifts right to left. So shift to the right leg, shift to the left leg. All right, we're gonna do a little side step, so make sure, just one side step, make sure you have some room. I'm gonna, not gonna make you move across the room. <laughs> All right, so you're gonna shift your weight to your left leg. We're gonna do a step out to the right, step in, step out to the left, and in. All right, so just a nice big side step. You can make it as big as you can. All right, good. Let's do one more each direction here. All right, now bring it back to center. Now we're gonna do just a little forward step. Now again, you don't have to have a lot of room forward. Don't walk into the bench in front of you. But we're gonna take that right foot, we're gonna lift the toes as we take a step forward, plant the foot, and then pick the foot up and step back. Left foot, lift the toes, plant the foot, pick it up and step back. Good, so lift and step back. And I know that any of you who have worked with a physical therapist maybe have been told lift your toes when you're walking. This is what we're doing. Lift the toes, shift your weight forward, lift the toes, other side. Good, one more. All right, very good. Okay. 
Now, if you're back where the benches are, kind of take a step forward towards the bench in front of you. We're just gonna take one step back. Now, you walk forward, heel toe lifting the toes, right? So if you take a step back, and you're not gonna be walking backwards, I know that, not too many of you do, but take a step back, you wanna have your balance, right? So what you wanna do, and then step up. Then the left side, toe, heel, toe, heel, and up, toe, heel, good, step up. Good, let's do that two more times. And up, good, nice and slow. And you can practice these at home. If you have a kitchen counter, you want to hold on to something, give yourself a little balance support, that's a good way to do that. All right, step the feet up. Okay, very good. We're going to stand up tall again. So when we talk about good posture, and good posture helps with your balance, so what you want to do is get those shoulders back as much as you can. Not everybody can get that shoulder back with Parkinson's, but try to get it back as, as tall as you can. Tuck the chin back, kind of think about standing up tall. All right, very good. Now from here, we're going to reach both arms up. Nice deep breath in again. Exhale, lower down. Good. Let's do that again. Inhale, big reach. Stretch it up. Exhale down. Okay, one more exercise we're going to do. We're going to do some boxing. All right, you ready? Don't stand too close to the person in front of you. <laughs> I don't want anybody getting hit in the back of the head. All right, so stand up tall. We're going to take the hands and make a fist, thumb on the outside, not too tight with the hands, just kind of a good fist here. Shoulders back and down. All right, so I'm going to give you two exercises, actually. We're going to do some punches, and I want you to use a nice, loud voice, and we're going to call out right and left. All right, so the right arm's going to punch across the body to the left. Left arm's going to punch to the right. We're going to call out right, left, right, left. Nice, loud voice. Left, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Two more. So crossing the body, right, left again. Ready? Here we go. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Two more. Last one. All right, good. Bring it down. All right, one more. We're going to punch down and across. All right, keep your shoulders up. You don't have to bend over. Just punch it down and across. All right, ready? Here we go again. Right, left, left, right, left, right, left. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Two more. Last one. All right, good. Bring it up. One more. I'm going to work your brains on this one. All right, you ready? We're going to put those three together. Side, side, up, up, down, down. All right, we ready? Here we go. Side, side, up, up, down, down, side, side, up, up, down, down, side, side, up, up, down, down, side, side, up, up, down, down. We're going to go faster. Up, up, down, down, side, side, up, up, down, down, side, side, up, up, down, down. One more. 
Good job, good job. Shake your arms out. Good work. Good work, good work. All right, let's finish up. We'll do a couple more stretches and then you can go to lunch. All right, drop the arms down. Take a big deep breath in again. Exhale, circle down. Good, again, reach up. This time I want you to hold it up there. Reach up as high as you can, reaching towards the ceiling. Reach, reach, reach. Okay, now you're gonna take your left hand, left arm, drop the elbow down, reach up with the right. Reach up, good. Switch it over. Reach, reach, reach up towards the ceiling. And again, reach it up and over. Good, one more time. All right, good, drop the arms down. Now take the arms out, we're gonna stretch the chest again. Open out, nice and big. Lift the chest. Those muscles get so tight in through the chest, let's pull them back. All right, we're gonna give ourselves a hug because you can't have too many hugs. Let's take the right arm on top. Hold on to the back of the shoulders here, the back of the arms, drop the elbows down, round forward, tuck your chin under. Hold that stretch with a deep breath in. Exhale. Good, take it open again. Other arm on top. Which one did I do? <laughs> drop the arm down. Good, round it forward. All right, open up again. Nice big stretch out. Reach towards each side. So I'm gonna, let's turn our palms up. We're gonna open up through the chest. Reach to the right, reach to the left as much as you can. Like somebody's trying to pull your arms. Reach, reach, reach. Good, drop the arms down and shake them out. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with this. Make sure you exercise. Anything you do is beneficial. If you can get out and walk, that's great. Walk around the block. Walk up and down your driveway if you need to. Just any place you can get out and walk. It doesn't matter how long. You know, people talk about exercise, and I think most of us get in our minds we have to do like 60 minutes of something and get your heart rate up. No, do what you can as long as you can, maybe five minutes, that's five minutes that you're moving. Keep those muscles moving. Exercise is really your best medicine. So keep moving, lift those toes when you're walking. Shuffling's only for card games, so no shuffling the feet. All right, thanks everybody and have a wonderful day. Well, thanks to Chris, who thank you for coming up and leading us in these yes. exercises and stretches. A few housekeeping things before you go to lunch. Don't get too excited here. Don't be leaving before I say what I need to say. No, really, guys, we want to we want to thank you for making it through the morning with us. Those of you online will join back here at 12:45. You'll hit the same link that you've used this morning. Nope, you won't use the same link that you used this morning you will use a different link. Yes, Abby, why don't you explain that different link to them? Virtual attendees in your email survey link that we would love for you to fill out. In-person attendees, your survey's in your packet. Also, virtual attendees, watch for an email from me that has links to all of our wonderful exhibitors. We were hoping to find a way that you could connect with them. If you're on our Facebook page, you saw lots of videos from them. We're also gonna send you a, um, an email that has links to um, something they wanted to make sure you had. So I offered it to them and said, what do you wanna make sure our 